It's out of your hands. You've done all you can do. Giving God the problem. It's no longer up to you. You've prayed the prayer of faith. Now you're standing on His truth. Are you waiting on the answer? He has a question for you. Is anything too hard for God? Who's got a problem beyond His power to solve? Question ought to stir our faith. Amen. Right. I appreciate our assistant pastor and his wife so very much. They've been faithful when it's not easy. Yeah. And I appreciate them. Miss Rebecca adds so much to our music program. I appreciate her. Her mom. And Jason does more than you'll ever imagine. Because I'm getting older and I'm not doing as much as I used to. Amen. But um, I thank God for my son. Amen. Proud of him. Been with me 15, going on 16 years. Anybody can root, stay with their daddy that long needs a purple heart. That's all I'm going to say. Well, let's get to the preaching. I mean, I'm getting all sentimental and mushy around here. But uh, thank God there is nothing too hard for God. Amen. How many was praying for something during that song, Raise Your Hand? I know I was. And I'm not going to stop until God either answers it or says, you're in the wrong direction, son. Pray something else. Amen. Let's keep on praying, church. Amen. Amen. I almost feel like bootleg preaching, but I'm not. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Spirit of God's in this place, brother. You know that because he walked in in you. <laughs> and he walked in and praying people that I appreciate that's prepared their heart for this meeting. Praying people. There's nothing like it. Praying together. Amen. Brother Alden, when you come and deliver the message God's laid on your heart, I appreciate Brother Alden. I've already given you his history. And uh, I'll tell you this. I'm just glad that this old geezer, his own words now, no disrespect, <laughs> has not retired, but I believe he's re refired. He's going to preach... Thursday morning to a bunch of preachers and their wives and guests. Some of our men are going to bootleg and go over there and look like preachers. And uh, then he's heading to try city Tennessee or county or something. And he's just going to keep on preaching. Last week, he was in <laughs> Gu Guyana. And I thought that was an island somewhere off the Bahamas. It's in the middle of South America. 33 people saved. Hallelujah. So this man's busy, and I'm honored and privileged to call him my friend. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. After that preaching Thursday, I think me and my wife ought to go courting. How about that, sweetheart? You sure look sad. <laughs> I think she needs to get up a little closer to the uh, glory spout. Amen? <laughs> no, she looks right nice to me tonight, but quite honest. I, 
Now, the doctor has done some work on my eyes, and I am able to see a lot better, praise God. I've had two cataract surgeries and two cornea transplant, and, uh, and I, can, I can see what most of you look like now. And um, I used to come to church, and so we all, all look mighty good tonight, <laughs> but you're all in a haze. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate, I really appreciate you folks uh, showing faithfulness unto the Lord in this meeting. Um, it's all about Him, praise God. And um, I will say this, in, our, in my humanity, it certainly encourages me uh, to see faithfulness. Uh, now, I'd preach if there was just two or three of us, by the good grace of God. Because I believe I'd have the same responsibility and obligation and privilege. But I believe also that it's wonderful when we can come together like this and feed together. Amen? And he's been saying a lot about this old geezer because I have. <laughs> old codger, old geezer. Well, I want to tell you about the old doctor who was a geezer. You better watch us old geezers. The fellow went to the doctor, the old geezer, said, Doc, I'm having me a terrible, terrible time. <laughs> Seems like my taste buds have all just left me. I, nothing tastes right anymore. Uh, you reckon you can help me? He said, why, sure I can help you. He said, nurse, go down to number uh, box number 25 and get a cup of that stuff that's in there and bring it back to this patient. And so she went down to box number 25 and she got a cup of stuff, whatever was in that box number 25, and she brought it back and, and he said, now you drink every bit of that. And so he took a big swallow and when he did, he started spitting it everywhere. He said, Doc, this is gasoline. <laughs> You've given me gasoline. He said, well, congratulations, you got your taste buds back. That'll be $500. <laughs> $500? Yep, five hundred dollars. Uh, well, you the doc, so he reaches in his pocket and pulls out the five hundred dollars and gives it to him. A little bit later, he comes back and he says, "Doc, I'm back. I'm sure struggling with again. This time it's my memory. It seems like my forgetter works better than anything I got. You got to help me, doc. I just can't remember anything anymore. Well, I think I can help you, young man, nurse." You go down to box number 25 and get some of that stuff and put it in a cup and bring it to my patient. <laughs> Doc, <laughs> that was gasoline. He said, congratulations, you got your memory back. <laughs> That'll be $500. <laughs> $500, yep, <laughs> you the Doc. <laughs> okay, here it is. Well, it came back one more time. He said, Doc, I'm back. Didn't particularly want to, but here I am. I can't see good, struggling with my eyesight, everything's blurry. He said, uh, now you know I don't work on that kind of, do that kind of doctrine, and you know I don't work on eyes. He said, why'd you even come to me? He said, I'm going to have to give you your money back. I can't do a thing for you. He said, I'm going to have to give you a thousand dollars back. So he reaches his, in his bill fold and he pulls out a bill and he gives it to him and and the patient looks at it and he says, Doc, that's not a thousand dollars, that's ten dollars. He said, Congratulations, you got your eyesight back. That'll be five hundred dollars. <laughs> you better watch us, old geezers. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I thank God a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. <laughs> and I enjoy smiling when I can, laughing when I can. There was enough of that other stuff. <laughs> and when I can come and just smile a while, and you ever heard that si song, Smile a While, Give Your Face a Rest? You ever heard that song? I don't sing worth a flip, but I'm going to lead you in it. Stand up if you will, please. You need to do this song. Some of you had not smiled in so long. If you'll just do what this song says, you'd be better. It increases face value <laughs> when you smile. <laughs> It goes like this. Now, please forgive me for my singing part, but you've got to hear the tune, okay? Smile a while and give your face a rest. Lift your hand to the one you love the best. 
Then shake hands with those nearby and give to them a smile. Let's do it. I said, let's do it, okay? All right, let's go. Sing it with me. Do what it says. You're quick learners. Smile a while and give your face a rest. Lift your hand to the one you love the best. Then shake hands with those nearby and give to them a smile. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, if you want to get them to smile, just do that. I, you can be seated now. I did that for years. At the Bible Baptist Church, sometimes that was the only way we could get them to smile, and so, even then I had to pay a few of them, amen. <laughs> All right, well, I believe what spending that brief moment of time with you, just enjoying our fellowship and being a little bit lighthearted, I believe it will not distract anyway or take away from the Word of God tonight because I'm going to preach a message to having to do with what the preacher was speaking about just a moment ago, about encouragement. I don't know about you, but I, I like to encourage, but I also like to be encouraged. Aren't most of us like that? Brother Danny Jenkins, I, it was so good to see you. I've thought about you so many times in a good godly way. I don't remember a whole lot about your theology and about your preaching and but I sure remember this, 35 years ago, perhaps, close to it, wasn't it? You came and preached when I just started and started and cranked up at Bible Baptist, and you, had our, uh, you were taking care of our school, our young people, and doing such a wonderful job. Wasn't my brother your song leader? He was your song leader. And uh, I don't remember a thing about his preaching that day, but I, there wasn't anybody in the country that had a better... Um, <laughs> turkey gobble than he did. <laughs> Brother, I'd be highly honored. You don't have to, but I'd be highly honored if you would just gobble for us a little bit. You reckon you could? Come here just a minute. I mean, we're trying to have a good time in the Lord. Can you get up these steps right with that back? <laughs> he got some back trouble. Now, I want to tell you what, this is worth your trip to church tonight. <laughs> Unless he absolutely blows. Now, I've waited 35 years for this. <laughs> well, how much am I going to get for this, brother? Uh, ask the preacher. <laughs> They're going to take them a special offer on They'll probably have to, maybe to get you to shut up, get us to shut up. Amen. Let me see uh, if I can do it. I'm trying to concentrate. I, get, hey, turn it up where y'all can hear him now. Come <laughs> That's Amen. Amen. <laughs> got the crew. That's, that's a turkey with a crew. I think I'd do better. Amen. I think I'd Amen. Do a bit better. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> it's still sick. <laughs> hey, wasn't that good? That's a whole lot better than gobbling than I can do. I promise you that. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's worth waiting 35 years for. And uh, brother, I'm going to probably wait another 35 years before I ask you to do it again. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, does that, even that, doesn't that kind of lift your heart a little bit? I mean, you're out in this sad, somber world. Everybody's having to try to tell dirty jokes. I mean, a lot of them are trying to tell dirty jokes and talk their filth to try to get somebody to life. Here we come to church and have a, an old preacher stand up here and tell a, a, old, uh, a geezer joke and another old preacher like myself stand up here and gobble <laughs> with what gobble he has left. <laughs> I think that's just wonderful. I don't know how that would go in some of your homiletical and pastoral theology classes, but, <laughs> but uh, it's good when you can come together as a family and if, if you remember, if you had the same daddy I have, that makes us kin folks. A whole what matter of love hath he bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Amen. And uh, thank you for being here and thank you for letting me laugh a while and smile a while and sing with you. And now we get into the preaching. I want to invite your attention, if I may please, and I always tell people when I go in a direction like this, you will know when I'm serious. <laughs> 
And uh, just a few moments, we're going to get into the Word of God, but it's not going, I don't think it'll be too heavy. Uh, some of the message we've been preaching this week, I believe God wanted it to be that way. It really spoke to my heart. Amen. The preacher really preached to me. And I'm not saying that uh, for any personal benefit or credit or any platitudes. Hey, I want to give all glory back to Him. Um, I know where my strength comes from. <laughs> and uh, without Him, I can do nothing. Absolutely. We talked about that last evening. But I can do all things, and so can you, through Christ which strengtheneth us. Uh, I enjoy, when I'm reading the Word of God, I enjoy... As I look at the Word of God, as they would tell us, Dr. Siler would teach us at Tabernacle, always strive, as we've already spoken, strive to get proper interpretation before you make practical application. That's so very important. And if you remember, I said then it lends liberty to make prophetic implication. I used to hear Dr. Siler say that when I went back to preaching and pastoring. I began to realize how valuable... That was to us. Uh, making sure we are finding out what God has to say as much as we're able by God's Spirit. In other words, it, it, we need to know it's not what we think about a text, it's what God knows. Uh, we ought to think like He thinks. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. I see in verse 19 of Acts chapter 11, I see the word now. <laughs> now. When I see this word now, that speaks to my heart as a transitional word, or at least opening up an, a thought that may require something else being said to give the fuller meaning. And you also remember, Brother Jenkins, when we studied in hermeneutics, uh, trying to get Scripture within its full context, and also not taking Scripture out of context, lest it become a pretext. It says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen. Now I want to look back for just a moment to refresh my mind and yours too, as it pertains to that persecution that resulted in the scattering. There's a preacher not too far from where you are tonight. He's a well-known preacher and he preaches many mission mess sermons and messages and he has constantly given himself uh, to the preaching uh, so that men may come to the Lord Jesus Christ and people will be further involved in missions. And I'm talking about Brother Stennett Ballou. Brother Stennett Ballou gives much emphasis to missions. And one thing, when he speaks about the book of Acts, he said there was a problem or a failure. He said if you look at the church at Jerusalem in its early beginnings, it had the masses or the multitudes, the people. It had the right message. It even had miracles. And on top of that, it had money but it didn't have missions. Now I remember also, and I'm, I guess because the name Dr. Seidler came up, I'm thinking about so much that was said by him that helped me so much when I was pastoring. He said, for example, a church that doesn't support missions will drown the stalk. He said, if you want to stay out of trouble, take on missionaries. If you want to get out of trouble, take on missionaries. And the best I knew how, I practiced that. You know why? Maybe for some carnal reasons, and I hope it was more than just carnal. I hope it was spiritual. But I didn't like staying in trouble. I didn't like being in trouble as a pastor. If you're a pastor, you don't particularly like to wake up and have trouble, do you? Matter of fact, you don't even like to go to sleep with trouble. <laughs> and maybe you need to tell to go to the other... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> That didn't go over. That went over like a lead balloon. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> but um, when we think about missions, he said to emphasize and to strengthen the church, you must be involved in missions. And the, this early church had all the good things going for it, but it didn't have missions. 
And with that being so, there was a stirring or a scattering that took place as a result of persecution. In Acts chapter 8, we see in verse number uh, 1, it says, And Saul was consenting, it's talking about the death of Stephen, unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. They were scattered. And devout men carried Stephen in his barrel and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the Word. They went preaching, went and preached the word. Philip, for example, went to Samaria. That was the loud populated place. And he went there and he preached Christ unto them. And there was great joy in the city as he began to preach Christ unto them. And I think reasons that they were experiencing great joy is because the Lord had taken upon their conversion, had taken care of their past. Now I'll tell you, there's nothing more thrilling to the heart of a new convert in just knowing that his past has been taken care of. And I thank God for that. I thank God that I don't have to be a slave to my path, and neither do you. And not only does he take care of our past, I'm talking about things that aren't bring great joy to us. He took care of their and our present. Things are different now. Something happened to me. Since I gave my life to Jesus, things you used to love before, you don't like anymore. And things you used to hate, you love so much more. I mean, that's the way it is. When you get saved, you're a different person. You're a new creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. And that's enough to shout about right there. But it's even better than that. He takes care of your past. Hallelujah takes care of your past and takes care of your present. But He also takes care of our future. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know when I pillow my head for the last time, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And uh, so we thank God for that. Well, that's what happened. They begin to scatter. And that gives you the proper context and understanding of verse 19 where it said, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phanasi and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm telling us, it still works when we preach Christ. And they, and this, and the hand of the Lord was with them. The hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go forth Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad. And I promise you, uh, when you get saved, the grace of God uh, should make you glad, not sad or mad. God's grace is a wonderful thing. It's an amazing thing. And so he had seen the grace of God and it, he was glad and he exhorted them all that with purpose of heart that they would cleave unto the Lord. A glad man doesn't have any problem trying to get someone else to be glad. <laughs> A sad man doesn't have any difficulty getting someone else sad because misery loves company. But Martimus was glad and he was trying to get the people around him. He exhorted them all that with purpose of heart that they would cleave or hold on to the Lord. For he was a, here's what it said about him, he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he sought him 
unto, uh, or brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year that they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were first called Christians. They were called Christians first in Antioch. When I'm reading my text, I'm talking about encouragement. I'm doing that because I know something more, and you do too, most of you, about Barnabas. He was son of consolation. He was an encourager. And um, I'm thinking tonight that maybe we can be challenged somewhat by this man that lived in the distant, dusty past. And yet he's there for us tonight, even to glean from and to learn from and to be encouraged. Uh, some of you tonight, you may be standing in need of encouragement. You've been going through some things and, and you're grateful when there's someone there next to you or in close proximity to your problem. I know the Lord is, but it's also good to have someone else there to encourage you. I recall that one aspect of my preaching was to exhort. And in exhortation, it would bring about encouragement. Nothing encourages like the precious Word of God. Nothing encourages and gives us hope as does God's Word. Uh, Are you downhearted? No, no, no. You don't have to be. If you're leaning on the arm of flesh, you will be. But you can let the Word of God encourage you. Well, Barnabas, he took the Word of God with gladness, the grace of God, and he tried to provoke others and exhort others and encourage others. And I want to take and borrow from that for the next few moments and look, consider this thought, the art, the art of encouragement. I certainly hope that I'm not in error when I call encouragement an art. If this should be so, then perhaps the one who encourages would be an artist. If his encouragement, I want you to think this way for a few moments. If his encouragement was a painting, it would be a painting that offers both value and challenge. Now paintings can affect a person. If a person sees a work of art, and he's a very passionate person, he cannot look upon that work of art without being affected by it. I don't know if you understand that or not, but I was preaching just a few weeks ago for Brother Lamar Whittemore in South Dakota. And on the airplane that I was traveling, they had something written up about one of the greatest American artist, I, I suppose, that has lived. He's, he, he's dead now. He died of uh, Alzheimer's. Terry Redlin. And while I was there in uh, Watertown, South Dakota, I learned that that's where his son built an art gallery. And Brother Whittemore, I mentioned it to him. He said, oh brother, you need to go and you need to look at the paintings. And when you look at those paintings, you'll take your time. Don't be in a hurry. And I took him at his word. And I went to that art gallery. And I walked through there. And I love painting with light. Using photography. I absolutely do not have the patience to use a brush. Sometimes he would work 22 hours in one day just to bring out what he was trying to portray with his artistic values and skills that he knew as an artist. So I walked in there with that kind of respect and all. And I would go from painting to painting. And then I got to a place where I knew I had to move on. So I went into one line of paintings that he had painted in tribute to his brother-in-law, who was killed in, South, in, in Vietnam during the Vietnam, Vietnamese War. And when I walked and began to look at that, he started out maybe with First Day, or maybe First Day Home. That could have been the title of the painting. I may not be exactly right in this, but it went something like this. And when you looked at it, you saw a, in the house that this young man that was being portrayed that was killed in Vietnam 
he's being portrayed by his brother-in-law uh, with a painting, and his mother and daddy's holding their little baby, maybe the first day home from the hospital. The first day. And then a little later, the first day of school. And then the first this, and the first that. And the first day. And I was walking along, and in my mind, I was traveling in time by those paintings that were so given so artistically in a way that it could, you couldn't help but just be drawn into to the expressions and the feelings that the artist was trying to convey. And as I would go, I would go to the place where he was leaving for service, and everybody was there to cheer him on. And then I saw his last day. I saw when they brought his body back home and the soldiers were standing there with the flag folded. And I walked away from that place. When I walked away from that place, I told my wife I felt like I'd been to a funeral. Now you say, well, that's so carnal. No, I don't know. I think God has given us passion and feelings and and I'm not stoic. I, do, I am moved by many different things. I, my, one of my greatest blessings as a pastor may be my feelings, my discernment about how other people feel. But that same great blessing may be my greatest curse. Usually your greatest blessing is also your greatest curse. You're very sensitive about people, and I am. I think my wife will admit that. You can't be a pastor. Your Dr. Cecil Hodges was correct when he said 5% preacher and learn 95% how to be a pastor. He said that'll take care of a lot of your preaching, especially when you're getting started. And so I walked away from that thing feeling what I'd witnessed. And, uh, and, and also the same sensitivity I'm speaking of. I, I dwell with people with, according to their problems. When I hear that someone's going through conflict or turmoil or trouble, I feel it. A dear lady, right now I'm concerned about, heard yesterday, uh, she has, this may be another one of those stretched out sermons, preacher. <laughs> uh, I can't hardly preach a whole sermon anymore. Get bogged down too quick. But I'm thinking about Sonia. Sonia English. I met her uh, in Germany many years ago along with her husband and her little children at the time. And they invited me into their home. And I went into their home while I was preaching in Germany. And they let me spend the Sunday. And uh, God put our hearts together, knitted our hearts together. And Brother English uh, felt impressed to lead of the Lord to, to leave Germany and come to the Bible Baptist Church where I was pastoring. We also had a Bible Institute. He wanted to come to our Bible Institute. So after 10 years of military service, he got out of the military, resigned his uh, position in the military, and then he moved his family to Statesboro. And I was their pastor for a lot of years. And now, I learned yesterday, and today I learned what was wrong, that she has thyroid cancer cancer, which I understand is a more treatable form of cancer, and that encourages me. But still, I'm, I've been thinking about it off and on all day. Off and on all day. And, and, um, and that sensitivity that you have, and that feeling that you have, if you say, well, preacher, I'm just not like that. I'm not saying that's a curse that you're not like that, because you'll have a strength in another area. If that's my strength, that may be your weakness, but your strength may be my weakness. I hope this is practical to you. I'm talking about encouragement. Encouragement has to some way, if you're going to be an encourager, you've got to care. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You've heard that quoted. And so to be an encourager, maybe you say, well, preacher, that's not my strength. I don't really care. Well, maybe you aren't to having a spirit-controlled temperament. Maybe you aren't to 
beseech the Lord and say, Dear Lord, I don't care like I should. I don't care if someone's hurting. I don't care if souls are going to hell. What better way to encourage someone than to keep them out of hell? What better way to encourage a mother or a father than to connect somewhat with their erring son or daughter and through encouragement and winning their confidence and their love and consideration, you take it beyond that. Over a period of time, you're able to be used of the Lord as a witness so that He can win them to Himself. Amen. One plant if been one water, but God giveth the increase. Yes. And, uh, and literally that Scripture, He that winneth souls is wise, is a military or a strategic term. And it's really talking, although we make application, it's really talking about gaining a person's confidence. Because ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ Himself is the true soul winner. He's the only one that really saves. Amen? And so, that's a way to encourage. And so we're having passion or feelings artistically. An artist or a doctor or a mechanic or a pastor or a ditch digger. No matter what you are, you need to have feelings for who you are. The skilled artist, <laughs> if his encouragement was a painting, it would be a painting that offers both value and challenge as I tried to illustrate with my visit to this art gallery of Terry Ridland, with the mid-tones being contentment. I've been told that the skilled artist will instruct the new student to put on the mid-tones first before applying the lighter and the darker tones. The mid-tones pull the extremities together. And I'm getting somewhere on this. Perhaps it could be said that the encourager likewise pulls the spiritual extremities together. On the other hand, worry pulls us in two different directions having a strangling effect as it does. When you worry, it's like something's just pulling you apart. When you encourage, it's like you're being pulled back together again. And so I, I want us to see this. It's encouragement. If you pattern it after Philippians, it should bring us to the state of letting our moderations be known unto all men. I remember years ago, here in one of the, to me it was a classic illustration of moderation. Let your moderation be known unto all men. He said something Jack Hudson did. He said something like this. He says, The devil cannot read your mind, but he can read your lips. He said, You need to be careful what you're telling the devil. You say, Well, I'm not telling the devil anything. Well, he may be listening while you're telling it to someone else. And so the Scripture says, let, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. But it also says, let your moderations, not your extremities, let your moderations be known unto all men. And be careful for nothing. Not careless, but don't be overly anxious for anything. For the Lord is at hand. You say, well... What am I supposed to do with my struggles and my problems and my pressures? Take them into your prayer closet where God can hear it. Let Him hear what you're wanting to tell Him. Don't tell everybody on Facebook and up and down the street and everywhere else. I, 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 there's some things that might be appropriate in social media, but there's some things that ought to be more private, reserved for the prayer closet. Amen? Because you let your moderations be known unto all men. I remember Dr. Sattler on one occasion, Dr. Clark said that, pray for the preacher. He's got over 101 in fever. And Dr. Sattler went to the pulpit that day. And I knew, and Brother Clark and some of the students knew that he had 101 in fever. He stood up there and said, It's such a wonderful time to be here in the house of the Lord. And we want to receive what God has for us today. 
And we want to look to God for our strength. I mean, went on and preached up a storm of 101 degree temperature. You know what he was doing? He was letting his moderation be known unto all men. He wasn't up there complaining and telling them how difficult uh, it is to stand up at the pulpit when you don't feel good. Now, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, his uh, wife was asked after his decease, what do you attribute? What do you attribute to the success of uh, Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher in England, who preached as many as 500 days in the same pulpit and would have to literally hold himself up some of those days because he suffered so much from gout and some other things. And, and his uh, wife said, we attribute perhaps his success to his thorn in the flesh. And they said, well, what was his thorn in the flesh? He, just, he suffered from acute depression. He would be very depressed. And his depression would overtake him many times and it was time to preach. And he would come up to the pulpit and in that state of weakness and despair, he would come up to the pulpit, his wife said, and almost had to hold himself up. And as he would preach, as he would preach himself out of the slew of the spine, he would bring his people with him. <laughs> And so God used that to even his infirmities and his depression and his sickness and everything that he had to contend with used it to encourage others because he had a mind to do so. So being an encourager. Well, Jack Hudson said, let your moderations be known unto all men. And he gave an illustration. How many of you remember he's still living? Jim Brown, the famous running back. No one could run like he could run, carrying that ball. Uh, he's 80 some odd years old now, and I, I wouldn't want to face him even now. I know he slowed down a lot, but a few years ago, I believe he still could have carried the ball. <laughs> I mean, that was the kind of person he was. He was an exciting person to watch, and he quit Many years before he really had to, he kind of quit on top of his game, I suppose. But anyway, Jack Hudson, many years ago, was telling a story about Jim Brown because at that time, Jim Brown uh, was still playing the game. That was early in my ministry, but it made such an impact on me as it regards the subject of moderation. They, so the reporter asked Jim Brown, said, Jim Brown... We want to know something about how you play the game. We've noticed something about you. Every time you get hit, you always get up slow. He said, that's easy. He said, sometimes when someone hits me, he said, I don't even feel it. It's like a feather, but I go down anyway. And I get up slow. Why is that, Jim? He said, because sometimes they hit me and they, light, they knock my lights out. And I have to get up slow. I don't have any choice. He said, but if I always get up slow, he said, then I can play hurt. And you know that illustration right there, it may be so simple. That illustration right there may be so simplistic. He said he always got up slow. But that illustration helped me tremendously as I pastored. Because you're not to always, in your own right, to encourage yourself. You're not to always express exactly how you feel about everything. Some things are to be reserved. Some things are to be kept to yourself and to the Lord. Many times people wonder why I wasn't dealing with a particular situation or a problem as a pastor. They didn't have a clue what I was really doing. They thought I was maybe just walking along without any consideration when in reality I may have been spending many, many hours, countless hours even having trouble and difficulty falling asleep praying and considering what God would have me to do instead of acting like a bull in a china shop. Old time preacher when I was very young said, 
sit easy in the boat. I don't know if any of you fishermen know what a stump knocker is. And I don't know if it's even a real fish. But it was the Oscar Etheridge. He said, uh, Preacher, I was starting out. He said, Preacher, now see here. He always says, see here. He said, see here. He said, you need to learn how to sit easy in the boat. He said, you ever been fishing for old stump knockers? He said, old stump knocker. He said, if you hook one. He said, ain't much to them, but... but That tastes pretty good in that pan. (laughs) He said, you hook one of those things and that old stump knocker, he'll go this way and he'll go that way and he'll wrap himself around one of them old stumps. He's a stump knocker. And you know what you'll do? You'll take and you'll, if you don't sit easy in the boat, you'll start snatching and jerking and pulling in every direction. Next thing you know, you done lost your little stump knocker. He said, but guess what? That little stump knocker, he don't like being around that stump always. <laughs> you give him a little time, a little space, he'll unwind himself. And then you just sit easy in the boat and you'll see him kind of taking off. And when he starts taking off, and you know he's taking off, he says, snatch his eyeballs out. <laughs> that helped me. That encouraged me, preacher. You said, that's not deep theology. No, but it was a man that was trying to render to me in simplistic terms where I could understand it. One was an illustration where he was telling about a famous running back. Why he always got up slow so he could play hurt. Another was sit easy in the boat. That encouraged me. When I was going through difficulties, I'm telling you, that encouraged me. I've had a lot of such Barnabas and and I really haven't got far into my text yet. That's the reason I said this going to probably be one of them at least two nights, and that's all I got left. <laughs> one more. <laughs> so we got to kind of rush up somewhere, either hold you for a while. But anyway, I've had people to encourage me, like Barnabas. Barnabas, he was full of the Holy Spirit. He was a good man. We'll talk more about that. And uh, he, he had good qualifications. In the spiritual realm. And I thank God for that. But think about people in your own right. My mama's been with the Lord now for so many years. You probably remember my mother and daddy. And they've been with the Lord now for so many years, my mother especially. But my mama, when I was growing up, I would be so discouraged. And I'd have people putting me down. And, uh, I was a sickly boy growing up. I remember I struggled for a lot of years, had my tonsils taken out when I was five and almost hemorrhaged to death. And and, uh, I was bullied and picked on. Uh, And I brought a lot of it on. (laughs) I I might have been a little run of a person, but I didn't like anybody walking over me either. (laughs) But uh, I remember old Gary Scarborough one day. We got into it with asbestos siding. Any of you know what it is? We broke up pieces and we had a way we could throw those things and hit somebody side the head and put a big gash and and see who had the biggest gash. (laughs) Just little fellas. I mean, we'd do stuff like that. Well, I must have hit old Gary Scarborough good because he took, and he was about this much taller than me. He took off running after me. And I mean, he, he was running wide open. And he came to where I was, and when he got to where I was, almost, <laughs> my mama had the door, screen door open. She said, she said, Max, run, run. <laughs> and I mean, I was just running fast as I could, but just hear mama say, Max, run, run. She slams that screen door as I slide in the first <laughs> on that hardwood uh, wax floor. I slid all the way from the dining room to the living room into the kitchen. <laughs> I was running so fast with my little legs. And she slams that uh, screen door. And then old Gary Scarborough, he hits up against it so hard. And my carpenter daddy comes home and fixes the screen door again. <laughs> but my mama, she'd tell, she was my encourager, my helper. I'd struggle in school. And, about, and it was a lot, most of it my fault. I didn't like to study. <laughs> And she'd stay up with me a lot of times late at night helping me with my study and my work. Max, why didn't you tell me you had some homework? (laughs) I I, I forgot. (laughs) That wouldn't fly with daddy. Mama, she'd help me. And she encouraged me. 
Well, I was her pastor right up till her death. And I had the honor of being her pastor. And sometimes I absolutely, preacher, felt like I'd laid an egg. This is so practical. But I believe we need it. Amen? I felt like I just absolutely laid an egg. I walked out, my old chin was dragging. Same church, I pastor when you came over to it. I walked to the I walked to the door to shake the people's hands. I didn't want to shake anybody's hand. I mean, I felt like, I mean, I just it would and then my mama, she shows up, shakes my hand. She said, Max, I just want to tell you, you outdid yourself today. I said, what? <laughs> she said, you outdid yourself today. And just by her telling me that, you know what I did? I threw my, my little shoulders back in a good godly way. I said, I believe I can go a little longer. I believe I can stay in the race. Encouragement. But, hey, being an encourager may be more spiritual than we think it is. Being an encourager, I don't have much respect for someone that's always trying to tear someone else down. But I had the utmost respect for someone that would just walk along and say, well, I know what you're going through. I want to be an encouragement to you. Sister, I want to be, be there for you. I, I got a wife back there. I've been to people that's lost a son like I have or a daughter. <laughs> and they know what it is when they're going through something so awful. There's nothing more horrific than that. And I've had my, and my wife, she's now because she can go up to someone and say, I know what you're going through. I remember years ago, even as a young pastor, I still want to be an encourager. I was 23 years old, pastor my first church, and a, a lady had just lost her 12-year-old daughter to staph pneumonia. Janice and Richard Johnson, that was their names. They just lost their 12-year-old daughter. They didn't even have a pastor at Mount Olivet. I was pastoring the Garfield Baptist Church. And I felt so bad with them not having a pastor. I went to the house and I sat all morning upon them receiving word from the hospital in Matter, Georgia that she had died of staph pneumonia. Only been sick a few days. I sat on that screen porch. I didn't have a clue what to do. I'd sit on that porch and I'd pray a while and my heart would swell up inside. And I didn't know if I'd ever see, get to talk to them because they were so overwhelmed. And in a little while, Janice walks out, the mother. And when she walks out and we're sitting together in the swing, I was trying to say the right thing. I was trying to be an encouragement. And I probably really blew it except for the fact God was with me. I said to Sister Janice, she didn't have her own pastor. I said to her as a young 23-year-old whip behind the ears preacher, never had preached a funeral in my life and was to soon preach a 12-year-old girl's funeral for my first one. I said to Sister Janice, I said, Sister Janice, I was trying to say the words appropriately, the best I knew how. I said, Sister Janice, I know what you're going through. And she stopped her crying and her emotions right then for a moment, almost like she was angry. She wasn't. She says, Preacher, I know you mean well. She says, but this might not have been the exact words, but it's the exact temperament of what she was saying. She said, Max, preacher, Max, you don't have a clue about how I feel and what I'm going through. And you know what? When she said that, I was taken aback. I had to immediately admit she was right. I did not know. I had no way of comprehending that kind of pain and hurt. And in that feebling state of trying to encourage her preacher, I realized then as a young preacher, I couldn't encourage her that way. God was so gracious. 
he then gave me this thought over in Hebrews. <laughs> that God Himself is touched by the feelings of our infirmities. When we're going through something, when we're going through the, uh, maybe a difficulty like that, we don't know how to touch someone else and be a help to them. But I was able to say to her, I said, no ma'am, you're right, Sister Janice, I don't have a clue what you're experiencing, but God does. God does. And God can give you that kind of help. Now, not too many years ago, as you know, I'm preaching in Mechanicsville, Virginia. I'm preaching up there on a Sunday. Sunday morning and Sunday night. I was supposed to preach the rest of the week. I get a phone call after we had a wonderful day. I preached and used my son Jamie in the illustration in that Sunday night service. Little did I know that I was going to get a phone call. After I got back from meeting, I get a phone call and they tell me, your son, they call and tell me, they said, Jamie, he's having a seizure or something similar to that. And the first thing that came to my mind, I said, I wonder if he's on some kind of medicine or something that is causing that. Then I said, oh, my mother, she used to have epilepsy. I said, I hope Jamie doesn't have epilepsy. And I was thinking that way. They called me a little bit later and said the seizures came about because he had a frontal brain aneurysm. He was bleeding in the frontal part of his brain. I drove all the way from Mechanicsville, Virginia to Savannah, Georgia to watch my son die. That was one of the longest, hardest trips I've ever experienced in my life. And then to go into that place and stay for another day or two until Tuesday, the 17th. And on that 17th of this month of May, they unplugged him. I knew then something I didn't know as a 23-year-old. I knew somewhat what it feels like to lose a child. Now, if someone's been through that, I still may not can feel everything that you can feel. But I hope I can encourage you. Because if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, what does it say there, preacher? about the God of encouragement. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Listen to this. I don't need an NIV Bible. <laughs> Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm about through, the Father of mercies. Aren't you glad is that? And the God of all comfort. I'm going to go ahead and tell us right now, there's no greater encourager than God Himself. There's no greater encourager. And you haven't got your little three-point homiletical gem tonight. But I am speaking forth from my heart, I promise you, what God's laid on the tables of my own heart. Blessed be God. <laughs> my son's wife, in her despair, she said, why did God take Jamie? Why couldn't have taken someone else? And God gave me grace. I didn't say it in a harsh way. I said, why not him take, why, why not him take Jamie rather than someone else? I said, would we want them to hurt like we're hurting? And when I said that, she got it. Am I telling the truth? She got it. God took that bitterness away. Because she said, no, I don't want anyone to feel what I'm feeling. I don't want anyone to experience what I'm experiencing. She had that much of God in her and Christ in her that she would just rather take on that veil of suffering and that sorrow than to give it cheaply to someone else. You may be called on to go through something that you don't like to experience or want to experience. I'm reading to you from God's sacred blessed Word. 
Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So I've been through something. You've been through something. Maybe you've experienced the comfort of God and haven't been through what I'm describing in your own right. Now you take the comfort that God's given to you and you take it in that precious, sacred bundle that only you can carry now in God because God's given it to you. and You hold very carefully that comfort that God's given to you and you take and share it with someone else. Amen? That's encouragement. This subject of encouragement is so big. It covers so much. You can't just put it in a small capsule. If you speak volumes, you can only touch the hem of the garment. Because every one of us in our own right can take and borrow from our strengths and even our weaknesses, such as Charles Haddon Spurgeon, his depression became his strength. And you can give it to someone else as an encourager. Be an encourager like Barnabas. We'll look at it a little more tomorrow night. Will you stand please? Your head's bowed and your eyes closed. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for being here tonight, dear church. Could I, if I haven't already, could I just encourage you? (laughs) Can I just tell you, as my wife told me one time when I was going through a great difficulty, I was about ready to give up. And with tears falling off of her face to her Bible that she was reading, In my bitterness and my anger, I was ready to give up. She said, Max, you've got to remember the last page hasn't been written yet. And she was so right. Can I encourage you that way? Maybe just to tell you it's not done yet. It's not over yet. He's not through with us yet. He's still working with us. He's still working with me. You say, well, when is he going to get through? That's his call. Right. See, I don't like what I'm going through. Are we supposed to enjoy it necessarily? We can rejoice, but it may not be comfortable. Right. And you can't rejoice if you had enjoyed the first time. Some of you may have to just let your moderations be known unto all men. You're going through such difficulty, but you're not going to tell anyone but the Lord. For he's the only one that probably can help in that situation. Someone's hurt you. Will you really help if you go and tell everybody how someone has hurt you other than the Lord? You'll probably have a lot of hurt people then. Because if you're bitter, your family will become bitter. Your friends will become bitter. The root of bitterness will spring up and trouble you there, and thereby many will be defiled. It was a rule around our house. If something was going on in the church, my wife and I would not talk about it in front of our children. We did not want our children bitter with the, or upset with the church. And I don't ever remember them speaking against the church because we didn't. Let your moderation be known unto all men.